you Alex, uh, I guess. meeting is being uh, recorded, so no I, problems. I, I, yeah. I, uh, uh, I think it is already being recorded. I yeah, cannot. Yes. Do it. Now it is. Yes. Yeah, no problems. Yes. Uh, yeah, it is showing. Us that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think that we can start our session, and our first speaker is uh, Professor Andrew Eberhardt from RMIT, and his. Uh, he will talk about abstract convexity and Alex Rubinov, a historical perspective. So please, Andrew. Thanks, thanks a lot, Adil. Uh, I thought that I'd uh, uh, give a talk on of this, this nature given the uh, uh, Memorial Day that we have here, but uh, it'll be a talk which sort of has uh, to some degree reflects on my interactions with uh, Alex, Alex Rubinov and, uh, and also reflect on a few things that have followed since Alex's uh, passed, since, uh, that have followed on from his work. So, uh, but uh, just to begin with, um, I guess generalized convexity in its current form probably date, dates back to the 1960s actually. Uh, so what we have is really uh, having convexity generated by something replacing the usual bilinear coupling function. And uh, I guess the, uh, I became first uh, aware of, of this kind of generalized convexity through the work of Deleschke and cohorts and, uh, and this particular paper and uh, uh, about fire convexity and so on, but I was unaware of Alex's work until much later. I was though aware that uh, uh, probably the first person who tried to talk about uh, convexity from the point of view of, uh, of uh, intersection of level sets of function was Kai Fan, in fact, and that, that uh, reference dates right back to the early 60s. But um, really uh, this paper, which has been talked about uh, a number of times already, in our discussions in, uh, today is really the birth of what we know as abstract convexity. So uh, the Minkowski duality and its applications uh, was uh, published in Russian in, in 1972. Uh, and uh, I, I gather from what I've read is in fact that it was written much earlier than that, probably about 69, uh, that, uh, that the book was completed, but it took a couple of years to be published. Now, um, of course, uh, Alex had a lot to do with the, with the working group on generalized convexity. And this is founded in 1994. And uh, this, uh, this is a group that uh, tried to, uh, to uh, I guess, nurture uh, the, all these things which you might call generalized convexity. In fact, if you go to their website to try and find out what you mean by generalized convexity, it, uh, it can talk about uh, generalizations of convexities in terms of level sets or supporting functionals or extensions of monotonicity arising from dust subdifferentials. And I think there's, a, there's such a, <clears throat> a zoo of things which we call generalized convexity that I believe for this reason, Alex coined the term abstract convexity to differentiate his approach from all these other approaches. So, uh, so going back to this phi convexity idea, well, I'm going to just look at that and then I'm gonna talk about abstract convexity. There's a very close connection between these two ideas. And um, you can kind of think of this as being one uh, branch of this way of approaching uh, generalizations of convexity. Phi convexity, what you do is you just replace the coupling function with some other nonlinear coupling function. But of course, then you can talk about the Fenchel dual and you can just take the supremum of the coupling function minus F. But of course, if you look at the Fenchel inequality, then that, that actually defines a function H which is a global minor of the original function f. And in fact, what happens is that in abstract convexity, you actually take this as a launching pad for where, what you talk about uh, convexity. So what you do is you start off with a generalization of linear functions, let's call this class L, and then you get the affine functions by translating all these linear functions. And then you talk about the support functions. So you look at all those things which are minor to the original function, that come from that class. And so you say essentially that uh, F is said to be a HL uh, convex, if indeed it can be generated by that support, the, uh, if you take all minorants, global minorants from that particular class of functions, and this generates the so-called support uh, set, the set of all these uh, abstract affine functions, which minorize the original function. And, uh, the, uh, the support mapping is called the, the Minkowski duality. So this is, goes right back to Alex's work in the 70s. 
So indeed, you could sort of certainly claim that abstract convexity's birth occurred really, I suppose, as early as 69, if you realise that the work, Alex did, Alex did a lot of this work as early as that. <clears throat> but, but going back to the fire convexity thing, of course, if you have eventual equality, then you can define some sort of subdifferential, and you can define a particular special minorant, which is, a, which is just a translate of one of the support functionals, which you can say is associated with this sort of fentanyl inequality. And so uh, these sorts of ab abstract convexity ideas can be uh, associated with subdifferentials. So those supports that we have for the particular function, if they're attained at uh, a particular point uh, uh, there, uh, X, then indeed this is the more classical notion of support and these indeed are going to be uh, what we use to define a subdifferential from the elements of the support function. So, uh, so in the case uh, when we have a, a lower support which obtains uh, the value of f at x, indeed that uh, is associated with the value of, uh, of y, which uh, attains the fential, uh, uh, the fential uh, 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 conjugate. Now. When I first uh, was aware of uh, some of these ideas, more through the avenue of phi convexity, my interest was in fact that I would like to have applied uh, abstract convexity to non-smooth analysis, which was the popular thing at the time. And so just uh, for, for the record book, if you do have these uh, supporting uh, minorants, then if they're differentiable and you take the gradient at the point where it attains its support, you get a fresh A subdifferential. If it's more than, one, more than twice continuously differentiable, its gradient is actually a proximal subdifferential. And if it's more than twice uh, uh, continuously differentiable, you take the gradient in the Hessian, you actually get the so-called viscosity subdifferential, which has developed quite widely in the theory of, uh, of elliptic PDEs. And so in very many areas where this notion does crop up. So um, um, the, uh, these uh, sub dual objects, which, which I kind of influenced me early on when I was looking at uh, these ideas uh, really came from Polowski and De De Lesch, uh, Relesch's work. And uh, they had this book uh, called Convex Analysis. Well, the subtitle was Convex Analysis Without Linearity. And I've often felt that this is, was, there was um, slightly a mistake in the title because it should have been Convex Analysis with Half Linearity, because indeed in the dual space, since we're dealing with functions, the evaluation functional, which is sort of the dual thing, is always linear because of uh, this, this uh, valuation, the linearity of the valuation functional. So, so at the time when I first met Alex, that was the sort of the trick I was interested in uh, was really based upon these lines. And I started to learn about abstract convexity through discussions with Alex about how you could use these ideas to study subdifferentials. So for instance, you could uh, do games like this where you could, uh, since you know that if you have a uh, a function from the subdifferential is determined by its conjugate. And if you have a difference of functions, as long as you can relate the conjugate of a difference of functions to the original conjugates, then you should be able to relate the, the uh, so-called abstract uh, uh, subdifferential to the individual subdifferentials, the individual functions. And of course, uh, this formula exists. It's the Toll and Singer formula, and it's totally general in abstract convexity. And, uh, and, and indeed, you can use these conjugate relationships to study the proximal subgradient. And so, um, so when I first met Alex, uh, when he came to Australia and Ballarat, these were things I was tossing around. And uh, this is, uh, I guess, the first time I met Alex was at this particular workshop in uh, New South Wales in uh, 1995. And uh, here's the proceedings cover. Uh, back in those days, we were not that sophisticated. We weren't publishing things in monographs from Kluwer or anything like that. They're all home jobs. And you notice here in the uh, list of uh, papers that were concluded in this particular talk, we had uh, John Borwine and uh, uh, Fitzpar Fitzpatrick, Giles, Yang, uh, Mond. Uh, we had Rubinoff and Glover. Rubinoff and Glover were looking at constrained global minimization of lower semi-continuous sublinear functions. They were looking at optimality conditions for sublinear functions in 1995. Uh, and here I was, I was looking at applying generalized convexity notions to proximal normals, which is what I've just discussed. And so, uh, so we had this sort of a, a um, kind of a, a orthogonal uh, 
uh, set of research, which was basically drawing from the same fountain at the time. And Alex, of course, came to Australia uh, the following year in 1996. And this is sort of started at a time when I, was, I, I interacted with Alex and discussed many of these things. And I guess I'm going to try and uh, uh, talk about the research he did in that period from 1995 to about 2000, which includes a period uh, discussing uh, the, the global optimization. And, um, and uh, I think the, the study of sublinear functions or things with generalizations of, of, uh, of uh, homogeneity is quite natural because, um, you know, they were studying that uh, with uh, Barney back in 1995. And in fact, Alex's uh, second book, uh, was actually a book on economics, dynamics, and equilibria. And uh, if you think about uh, uh, the uh, sort of functions to deal with in, in economic modeling, the uh, utility functions often follow the law of diminishing returns. And this is actually kind of a relaxation of positive homogeneity. And so indeed, also, if you think about the Minkowski gauge function, which is also something that Alex had studied back in uh, 1972, uh, you look at the Minkowski gauge function for a, a radiant set, which are things which are kind of, uh, you can shrink lines to the origin in that remains in the set. And you look at the gauge function, well, of course, Mikowski gauge function is, uh, is, uh, is going to be positively homogene homogeneous. So uh, uh, these sort of functions are things which uh, Alex, I think, was quite familiar with through both economic uh, modeling time of his uh, research and the study of the Mikowski gauge functions and so on. And, uh, and so when, when, when Alex came, it really started a very interesting time. I mean, I think that period from 1995 to 2000, shortly after, was full of a, a, a rash of visitors, uh, really some huge names, which, uh, <clears throat> you know, I was very lucky to have met when I was reasonably young as an academic. <clears throat> and I remember those times, and, and I remember early on discussing with Alex uh, this uh, particular issue, we're discussing the, the notions of generalized convexity and the uh, proximal subdifferentiability. And I, we were talking about how the convex uh, subdifferential was quite unique in the way that it had a local representation, which comes from the directional derivative. It's defined by information locally around the point X. But of course, it provided global information about the minorant that came from that information. And uh, at the time, because I was working on all these things about proximal subdifferentials, uh, I said, well, you know, the local information which you can take from the gradient of these things uh, provides you local information, but you lose the global information that you've got in the original uh, subdifferential from the uh, phi convexity or the abstract convexity. And in, in any case, most of, at that stage, most of the generalized convex classes that they had, and when you look at the class that you generated when you took the supremum, you tended to generate all lower semi-continuous functions subject to some global bound. <clears throat> and Alex was quite quick to respond to this assertion. Some days later, he emailed me and said, I've been thinking about what your comments are about, uh, your comments about global versus local in generalized convexity, and I believe I'm, I can make progress on this issue. And as you say, the rest is history, because I think that uh, the, the book that is most uh, quoted, The Abstract Convexity in Global Optimization, is a manifestation of, of Alex's really amazing insight into that particular issue of, of local versus global. And I'll try and expand on this in this talk as I go along. So I've actually just extracted the second paragraph from the introduction from that book there. And, and I think it's, it, with these things in mind, I think it's quite insightful because it says, um, the simplest and most well-known area of global, uh, of global and simultaneously local optimization is convex programming. Fundamental tool in studying convex optimization is a subgradient which actually plays both a local, local and global role. First, the subgradient of a convex function at a fixed point carries a local approximation of f and a neighborhood of x. Secondly, the subgradient permits the construction of an affine function, which doesn't exceed f over the entire space uh, and coincides with f at x. The affine function h is called a support function. Since f is bigger than h for all y, the second role is global. In contrast to local approximation, the function h will be called the global affine support Generalization of the definition of convex subdifferential based on local approximation has led to the development of non-smooth analysis. Generalization of the def definition of convex subdifferential based on global affine support can be studied in the framework of abstract convexity. So the birth of abstract convexity occurs 
And, and here is uh, the way in which I think Alex had uh, insight, I think uh, uh, motivated by his interest in, in, in positively homogeneous or uh, functions and things of that nature, which he'd studied in various other contexts. So the class of, uh, of uh, general, generalized linear functionals that he defined uh, was this class. <clears throat> and he had the minimum over the positive elements of L of the product of Li Xi, which replaced the usual sum of Li Xi, which is the usual inner product. Okay, and these are actually concave uh, uh, functions. And so uh, what we find, for instance, is that uh, uh, a class that's related to these things from a generalized convexity view viewpoint is the increasing convex along ray functions, the ICAR functions. And what they are is we have, if we look along a ray from the origin, we have this function convex and it's also increasing. So uh, what we can do is we can look at all the uh, affine functions generated by this class L. And uh, then what we can do is we can ask the question, uh, what is the uh, class of L uh, HL convex functions? And we discover that they are exactly the increasing convex along grade functions. So um, here we have the kind of global description. Well, George, isn't it? Well, just and uh, we can look at two other classes, related classes, uh, Alex the yeah. Somebody's uh, got their mic on. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll also look at two other classes uh, uh, that associated this uh, set of uh, abstract linear functions. Um, and uh, uh, all the, and uh, in fact, we could look at the class where we don't uh, take the translations, the affine functions, we just take the linear functions. And this turns out to be exactly the increasing positively homogeneous class. And there's a third class which is also related to uh, these uh, notions, I think, which probably came from the study of the Minkowski uh, 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 function. And these ideas of so-called, uh, uh, um, uh, I think, the co-radiant sets. But we can say that something is, uh, we can also look at sets in the class of functions L. Okay, so again, convex functions should have sets associated with them and sets should be associated with convex functions, there should be some relationship. And so you can think of uh, convexity on sets of functions as being one in which you have the, the, the convex set U as being the support of some convex function. And these turn out to be exactly the, those that are closed along rays and also have this uh, 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 normal. In other words, normal is associated with a, 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 a partial order. And what happens, of course, is that uh, it uh, means that if you have something that's less than your current element that's in the set U in the partial order, that new element is contained. It. So it's like a radiant set. And um, the same notion exists for uh, L convex functions in Rn. It's just that you reverse everything around and the partial order is the usual one on the positive ornithant. And this actually leads to the idea of monotonic analysis. So when you start looking at the sets associated with these particular classes of functions, you end up getting these classes of sets that have these uh, radiant or co-radiant uh, properties and uh, you end up getting what we call monotonic analysis. So um, the third class of functions which uh, Alex uh, had in his book was associated with these co-radiant sets. So uh, the, uh, the class is the class of functions whose epigraph are co-radiant. And co-radiant is sort of opposite of star shaped, if you like. If I have a point in the epigraph of F and a lambda bigger than one, then if I stretch that out, it winds up remaining in the set. Now, if you look at what that means in terms of the function, it means you have this sort of relaxation of positive homogeneity associated with these uh, functions which are co-radiant. Now, that gives us really three classes. Now, this turns out to be also a generalized convex class, and I'll come to <clears throat> what the generators are of this in a moment. But um, it turns out that this particular class is, is very closely related to uh, IPH, the increasing positively homogeneous class. Okay, so, uh, uh, and in fact, when we start to look at a, an example which gives us some idea of why do we need three classes, well, it, they kind of cover all possibilities. If I look at the so-called Copp-Douglas utility function, <clears throat> then um, it's got this form and uh, you can ask, well, what, for what values of the alphas do I get which uh, members of what class? 
<clears throat> and if my sum of my alphas are bigger than one, I get an uh, increase in convex along ray or LH convex. If the sum of the alpha is one, I get IPH, which is L convex. And if the sum is less than one, I get these I car. And they are also convex as well, abstract convex. Uh, and they're also quite interesting in that um, they, they're closed under all sorts of uh, operations. <coughs> Sums, minimums, maximums, all sorts of things retain this class. And they turn out that the ICAR functions are actually uh, uh, abstract convex with a slight extension of the class that we have. You sort of add, add on another scalar. And this comes about because, in fact, there's a relationship between the ICAR functions and the IPH functions. So the increasingly positively homogeneous function and these ones associated with co-radiant sets are really just one, just one dimension out. There's a kind of a lifting that allows you to get from one class to the other class. So if I have an ICAR function, I can always make a positively homogeneous extension, which is defined there. And it turns out that this is an increasing function in both variables X and Lambda, and therefore turns out to be an IPH function. And so when we apply our theorem about convexity, uh, L -H -H -L convexity to F hat, we discover that these up here turn out to be the generating functions of our ICAR functions. So uh, what about this global versus local? Well, let's look at the I ICAR functions, the increasingly convex along ray functions. So if we define uh, this uh, one over, be a vector associated with X, where it's one on X if it's positive, and zero otherwise, then if I have an ICAR function at a non-zero point, and I look at the ray, the function along the ray, which I know is convex, it's got a convex subdifferential because it's convex along rays. Now, if I look at its convex subdifferential at one, and I form these ratios in the sense, I can generate uh, uh, elements of my subdifferential. And actually, that's a characterization of f is strictly, con uh, con strictly increasing at that point. And in particular, I always have this representative of the subdifferential, which is associated with the directional derivative at the point x in the direction x. And so what we have is the description of this subdifferential is entirely local. It involves only the directional derivative. And here we have local implies global. And this is exactly what we have for convex functions. And, and here I think is the, is the uh, jewel of the insight that Alex had, which led to his approach to, general, to global optimization. Because if you have such a property holding, then you can proceed as if you would with uh, convex optimization. So the generalized cutting plane method is really just a generalization of the cutting plane method of convex optimization. So uh, let's um, look at cutting angle method and things of that of that nature now. <clears throat> so if I have a, a subdifferential which has that property, if I can uh, have local equals global, then I can go have an algorithm where I can select a whole lot of points, x1 up to xk, and I can generate their subdifferentials because I can generate it from the local information. And then I can get a global minor by taking the maximum of all those minorants. And so I get this uh, um, kind of a piecewise uh, 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 minorant. And, uh, and what I've done here, of course, I've done a translation so that of, the, of these guys, so that they wind up equaling F, uh, the function f at the point uh, uh, that I have at my xi. And, uh, and so what I can do is that, um, uh, of course, uh, what I do here is I'm going to minimize that surrogate, which is my uh, piecewise affine minorant as my tool in trying to generate my new points in my algorithm. Now, of course, uh, <clears throat> there's an overhead in this. I have to minimize this min type, well, a maximum of min type functions. <clears throat> uh, but I ascertain that, that the fact that we have to do this is part and parcel of global optimization. I mean, you really can't get away with having to face uh, doing these, uh, these uh, solving such problems if you're going to take this approach to, to global optimization. So let's take a step back and think about uh, a situation which often many people talk about, which is that we can always do global optimization if I know I've got a Lipschitz function and I know the Lipschitz constant. So if you take that into mind, then if you think about knowing the Lipschitz constant, then I can always generate 
my global affine, uh, my global minorant in a similar way by taking my abstract convex functions as just being fxi minus l, the norm of x minus xi and infinity norm. And, and it turns out, of course, that's just a min function as well, because I'm, su I'm subtracting the max of, of, of moduluses. And so it's a min function as well. And so what you get is you get a min type function that you have to do your, your, your minimization of as being your step in your optimization problem. So, so it kind of goes with the territory. You can't really get away with having to face those kind of uh, problems. So, so the generalized cutting plane method just goes like this. You say, well, I start off with a point. I take a, a, a linear function, the subdifferential. I, I translate it appropriately so it supports my function at the appropriate point. Then I end up having to do a global minimization of my surrogate, which is my maximum of a finite number of choices. And when I find that value, I call that my next point. So it's really just a generalization of the cutting plane method for convex functions. Now, there are a few things that come out very easily for this. And this is quite cute because this is totally general. If I keep track of these scalars, which I have at the top of the slide there, I know that uh, the, the lambdas increase so that they've got a limit. I know that the mu k's and the lambda k's always bound my actual optimal global solution. And so I can take the min of the mu, mu i's and to get this new, new k. And so new k minus lambda k is an optimality gap. And I wind up, of course, having my global value sandwiched between those two guys. And so at any stage, I know how far I am from optimality. So, so that, that's, that's really nice. Now, if you look at the, the, the theorem, the general theorem for convergence of this, <clears throat> it says essentially that if L consists of concave functions and Xi is an infinite sequence generated by the algorithm, and if my HK, my, my surrogate, keeps its gradients bounded, then each limit point is a solution of the global optimization problem. Now, the interesting thing about this, of course, is that you need to have concavity of your generalized linear functions. Now, look, it's well known, um, there's a close affinity between global concave optimization or concavely constrained optimization and integer programming. This is really commonly known. And, uh, uh, and, and by the way, if I use my previous uh, inf, uh, concave functions here, it's, this is where the so-called cutting angle method comes from because uh, really the level sets of these guys are just translates of the positive ornithine, and so they really are right angle cones. And so I'm cutting with cones in my, in my space. That's why it's called the cutting angle method. So, so if I go through and I substitute in uh, the relevant things, I know, of course, that this guy up here is always an element of my subdifferential. So I, I make the appropriate substitutions of the various things. In my previous algorithm, I get the so-called cutting angle method. Okay, and this is uh, what people are being referred to. Now, of course, what I've got is I've got the step three here, which I have to solve. And so, of course, there's no free lunch. And so this is my, my problem I've got to deal with. And so what we have to do at each stage is I need to minimize a, a function which looks like this. And uh, so if I try and write down in terms of, uh, of, the, uh, of the min functions, what that really amounts to, I can write, write this guy down. I've got a set of these. And I ask the question, well, how can I perform this minimization? Now, uh, at the time, in fact, I had, I had the luck of, uh, of actually having Alex ask me to a supervisor uh, to, to be examiner for uh, Mikhail Andromanos thesis, who, who was the guy who was a PhD student who worked on a lot of these things. And I actually did consult his, uh, his thesis, which I have a copy around at the time. <clears throat> and Mikhail Andromanov did in fact use this following trick actually at the time to solve these problems. But of course, later on, people, uh, Alex and other people, and I think Ma 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 Andromanov and him developed other techniques to solve these problems. Uh, and all of them have a strong combinatorial flavor. They can have a flavor of either branch and bound or, uh, or, uh, or things of that nature, right? But at the time, what they did, of course, is they just transformed this into an integer programming problem. So if you introduce binary variables, you can write down a set of inequalities and you get an integer programming problem that you can easily throw into a, into a standard solver and you get a solution. Okay, but it really comes with the problem is that what you've got here 
is an optimization problem with a strong combinatorial flavor, and you have to have something which has to take that into account. And, and, and so, and it comes from the fact that you're dealing with these concave uh, functions. So it makes a strong connection to it, I, I believe, anyhow. So, so let's now just move on and say, well, that wasn't where things stopped. Um, that in fact, <coughs> this allows you to try and do global optimization with a Lipschitz function. And so um, <coughs> unlike, the, um, unlike the example I showed before, when you approach it this way, you don't actually have to know the Lipschitz constant. You just sort of, in a sense, have to overestimate it. And so what I can do is I can take a, a, a Lipschitz function, I can form a function here, which is uh, really trying to tr put the function onto, uh, onto the unit simplex, if you like, and make it positively homogeneous degree P. And uh, so uh, what I get when I do that is G becomes a, a function on the unit simplex, and it has this positive homogeneity degree P property. And if I choose P to be sufficiently large, where there's, a, there's an exact statement of what it is, it has to be larger than this value. And so uh, what I have to do is make sure that I've got a positive function in the first instance. And I don't need to know the Lipschitz constant, but I have to overestimate it. And so if I do that, then I get an ICAR function. And the ICAR function happens to have certain properties. And it turns out that it's, it's a directional derivative uh, of its uh, along the line, which you have to have for its uh, subgraded gives us an explicit expression for the element of the subdifferential here. So from these properties. And then what I can do, of course, is that I can, I can relate this to even harder problems. So here's just a little a taste of the sort of things you can do to try and drive other problems into this format. So if I have a Lipschitz function subject to a Lipschitz constraint and linear inequalities, then I can try and, uh, uh, sorry about that. I can try and first absorb the Lipschitz function into the objective with a penalty. And then I can increase the uh, dimension by one with a slack variable to try and uh, look at my, uh, to change the way I write the constraints. And then I can do a transformation, which is a well-known transformation called the projective transformation, which is used by um, people in um, early, early stages of interior uh, point methods. <clears throat> and uh, then I can rewrite my problem as a Lipschitz optimization problem on the unit simplex, subject to some linear constraints. So with that in mind, what I find is that uh, I wind up getting as a general kind of problem that I have to solve to take into account of these rather large class of problems. I have to try and uh, develop an algorithm that solves something on the unit simplex, subject to linear constraints. And uh, so what I'll do is, of course, I want my function to be positive. So I choose a big M to make it positive. And I do my transformation of my original function to put it onto the unit simplex. And I put all my other uh, constraints into that way. And I can easily write down, as long as I've got my P large enough, exactly what an element is of the subdifferential. Because I know this is an I, uh, ICAR function. I know exactly the characterization of subdifferential. I know what this uh, element uh, uh, here is. And uh, so after I do a little bit of translating, I get the element of the sub differential, and then I can apply the cutting angle method. And so we build on the cutting angle method, and now I can minimize a Lipschitz function, which requires me to choose a big enough M to make my function positive, choose a P that's big enough to force it to be an ICAR function. And then I substitute into the general method, all these elements that I've talked about before, and the algorithm looks the same with just the new modifications. So then we've got an algorithm for Lipschitz functions. So, so I want to just conclude uh, my talk today by going on to talk about one other thing, which is uh, a little bit about Lagrangians and augmented Lagrangians, which is something that I got involved with after Alex is passing. And I know Regina was working with Alex on some of these things. And I will talk a little bit about Alex's and Regina's work. But it's, a, it's an area in which, um, uh, just to sort of follow the theme I've been discussing, has, take, has been taken up by the most unlikely group of people you might imagine, is that it, it got noticed by the integer programming community. And people in the integer programming community worked and did alternative versions of this kind of thing because it's connection with duality and integer programming. 
So, uh, of course, we know that Alex worked quite widely on the augmented Lagrangians with Yang and Baratchik. Uh, Baratchik after later on, and of course, uh, 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 Zhao Qi talked a little bit about this book and some of the work. <clears throat> but I'd rather talk a bit, a bit, a bit more about um, the work I think relates to what Alex and Regina did, which really talks about trying to look at a problem where you minimize, where you're, sorry, I'm going to write this thing all down in maximization now. So, so what, what happens when one starts to work across areas? I've worked a little bit with integer programming people now, trying to apply variational analysis in that field. And integer programming people tend to write things down in max problems, and we write them down as min, you know, and you get this jarring of the way in which people write these things. So I've written all this stuff down as maxes. Um, and so we're looking at maximizing a function over a compact set. And Alex and Regina, our compact set, could look a little bit like this, x such that function phi x equals zero, and they, they could allow the inclusion of concave constraints, and that can force integrality, of course. And uh, that got recognized by the IP community, and uh, then people got interested in what it could say about duality in this program. So, so in the paper I, I've chosen here, Regina and, and uh, Alex, uh, put down some very general hypothesis for a Lagrangian function. So they, they needed just to have a special set of, uh, well, x0 is really the feasible points. So you have to have the Lagrangian equal the objective function on the feasible points. You have to have a, a, a hypothesis that basically says that the special set of, uh, of multipliers that you might choose interacts with infeasibility of the constraint set of the, of the feasible points in some appropriate manner, so the Lagrangian behaves appropriately, kind of recognizes those things. And, and the special set of uh, Lagrange multipliers has to uh, uh, generate this inequality, which, which makes it kind of consistent with our usual notions of, uh, of duality. And, uh, and in, in this theory, the compactness of these upper level sets were quite important in the development of the, the theory. So, so our, our Lagrangian, it will be the maximum over R of the Lagrangian function. And then I take the minimum over the lambdas, gives me my dual value, right? Now, if I think about an integer programming problem, then I could take my phi of x as being the uh, infeasibility was subject to some linear constraints and the dist distance to the feasible set x, which could contain all the integrality constraints. And so that then my x0 would just be the usual set associated with linear equalities and, and integrality constraints on, on x. And therefore, I should be able to write down something about the integer programming problem and its dual. And I can, I can write down a augmented Lagrangian like this. And I could take my special set of multipliers, be zero cross R plus. And uh, my lambdas are all the mu's and the sigma's positive. And I can check my, my hypotheses. I can see that, uh, that uh, for feasible values, when AX equals B, I get what I want. And I can see that my special set of multipliers gives me the correct minorant. And the third one can be proved also that uh, along exactly the same lines in Alex and Rub uh, Rubinos and Baruchik's paper in example six. And so this is provable. And so I can write down my, my dual problem. And I can say that the maximum over X of the augmented Lagrangians and then femum over sigma and lambda gives me a Lagrangian dual, which equals my IP optimal value. And this, uh, the last inequality relies upon my, my a feasible optimal solution, if you like, being bounded in some sense of that. Things, I can, I've got to be able to induce some sort of compactness now. Uh, this is all very good, but the, 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 this last assumption kind of jars a bit with the culture in integer programming. In fact, most of the theory of, of integer programming relies upon assumptions like all coefficients in the objective and, the, and the, the linear constraints have rational coefficients. And this is enough to ensure the existence of an optimal solution. And so unboundedness is quite often sort of very, very prevalent, right? So, so this attracted the attention of a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Natasha Bolin. And so we wrote a paper on augmented Lagrangians where we posed some hypotheses on the penalty function and then we, we made some assumptions to try and replace the boundedness assumption. And one assumption was that the LP relaxation did not contain a linearity space. 
that's the optimal solutions of the LP or relaxation. Or the matrices A and A and uh, uh, and uh, the constraint set have rational entries, and the and the norm in my my phi function above is the infinity norm. Or we could assume that the we had a like a a, a binary problem is that the integrality constraint constraints had a convex being bounded. And so then we could generate the following uh, result. We could get, a, get our dual bound being the primal bound, but also we could get this other characterization, which is often known as being the primal characterization of the dual bound in integer programming, which relates the uh, dual bound to some sort of convexification of the original integer programming problem. Now, it turns out that if you do ordinary Lagrangian relaxation, you get a, a, a dual bound, which is less than the IP value, and it differs from that dual bound in the proposition at the bottom of the page there, in that in the con, you only have X, not the constraint to the feasible set. And that's the difference. And so in fact, uh, we get this sort of generalization of this, uh, this, this value, this, uh, this theorem. And the reason why these, these uh, primal characterizations of the dual bound are important in the programming, because it helps them understand <clears throat> what they're doing, what they're bounding, it helps them in understanding their the bounding process, which is what's used in branch and bound. <clears throat> now, there, there were some other work done by some other colleagues of Natasha and uh, Georgia Tech, who uh, went on to show that um, um, that for a mixed integer programming problem, you could actually find a finite sigma and a multiplier, which could be taken as the multipliers of the linear programming relaxation. And you could get a exact duality. And uh, it turns out that their, their primal characterization of this, um, and, that, and this, by the way, was provable on the assumptions that we have in the previous page of two, which is where the matrices have their rational entries and the norm that we use as being the infinity norm. Then, um, uh, then what, you, what you can do is you can have primal kind of characterization of the dual bound for this finite sigma in terms of this S row set where it involves a kind of a relaxation, a kind of a perturbation of the constraint set uh, with, the, with a sort of mega perturbation. When this is what you take your comb over is this sort of diagonal set of this perturbation. And so, so, um, so it's interesting um, where some of this theory has gone and who took notice of it. Uh, so it, it's not just people in continuous optimization that have noticed uh, some of the work that uh, Alex and other, and other colleagues have, is that indeed what I, th I find quite interesting about this is that uh, there's still a lot of rich theory here that still has a lot of uh, scope for application. And I would assert that there's this, this area where you reach out into abstract convexity to global optimization, um, because you know the, the integer programming is global optimization in a sense, you know, it, it is a global optimization problem. And uh, uh, if you try and look at the variational analysis and abstract convexities applied in this area, you squarely run into combinatorial optimization. You know, that's just unavoidable. And in fact, it's actually something I think that one should embrace and say, this is where these, these areas meet. And this is actually in the place where people interested in theory can actually ge generate theory for integer programming using techniques that we are familiar with. And, uh, and I think that's quite exciting, you know, I, I do think, and uh, uh, that I, I'd like that to be a message to take away. The second message I'd like to take away from this uh, talk is that, uh, that, that there's wide area of research in combinatorial optimization where people just take Barovi and CPLEX as black boxes that just generate a solution to a MIP. And the whole research is about how can you lever leverage the, sol the solver to solve harder problems. This is a whole area of research. And in a sense, what uh, Alex's uh, cutting plane method is a method of that kind. It's really leveraging combinatorial optimization to make an impact in other areas. Um, and, uh, and I would assert also, given the time lapse since Alex revealed these secrets, there's a, really a, a, a much more scope for research in this area. And in fact, the effectiveness of IP solvers are outpaced Moore's law, improving faster than the speed of the computers on which they run. Now, this is a fact, you can see plots of this. People who try and sell these products will show you these facts and it's going exponentially faster. So, um, uh, so in this work, we uh, see no use, by the way, in the cutting plane method. This is one thing that struck me when I was looking at, at this and trying to sort of uh, 
do a summary of this. If you think about cutting plane method as being a generalization of the cutting plane method of convex optimization, really what we do these days, we do the bundle method. And the bundle method is the stabilized cutting plane method. And we don't have a stabilized cutting plane method in abstract convexity yet. And I think that's a big omission. I don't see why there shouldn't be one. And I think somebody should, should develop one. So that's an invitation for people who, who, who uh, look at this talk to think about how one might do that. And I don't also see things like proximal point methods, which are typical of convex optimization. And I don't see any splitting methods. I mean, this all came after Alex, Alex's passing, but I mean, in convex optimization, splitting methods, how, how you leverage the size of the problems that you can solve, you know, by using, by, by generating smaller problems to solve, right? And that's, uh, that, that's ripe, I think, for this area, because really what you want to do is you don't want to solve uh, you want to break it down into smaller problems where where you have to do the combinatorial end of this of this of this problem. And, and also, I'd like to say finally is that you know things that have happened since Alex's passing. I mean, the theory of abstract monotonicity is now exists, and Mojave and Everhard uh, were the first people to do this, and people like Martinez, Legazza, Juan Enrique, and uh, and Rocco, and so on have gone on and done other work in it. And now there's quite a reasonably well-developed uh, uh, area or theory of abstract, mo uh, uh, abstract monotonicity. And of course, the abstract subdifferential is maximal abstract monotone. And so, uh, so uh, there is a, is a strong, strong uh, potential for using some of that, which it has been used in convex optimization and so on to study convex optimization in recent times. Monotonicity uh, is, is an important tool in study of, of modern uh, convex and uh, optimization. Uh, and uh, so I hope that uh, uh, really, really, I think uh, the work that Alex did is too long for one talk. And I've really just picked on a couple of areas here to try and summarize. But I do feel as though it'd be nice to see people take up the baton in some of these areas and try to see where they couldn't push uh, some of these things a bit further with some of these suggestions. and. Uh, and I think also one needs to embrace this uh, connection to um, to um, to combinatorial optimization it seems to arise, I believe, quite naturally when you're looking at these things. So here are uh, some of the references associated with uh, what I have uh, talked about today. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So uh, now I think that we have enough time for questions. Sure. Any question? Hi, Andrew. Hi. I have a, uh, a question. So, um, uh, so for all the uh, open questions, open direction you mentioned, I was thinking that um, there is one thing that I, I'm not sure uh, is this, um, uh, can we develop some kind of derivative for abstract convexity? Because uh, for standard convexity, we have derivative. It's quite inconvenient that when we calculate in the smooth when the smooth function, and then for some some point where it's function not smooth, we do some kind of um, convergence and we get the uh, subdifferential. But then uh, when I try to yeah, there no derivative derivative two. And uh, like you said, for um, mixed integer linear programming, we don't have kind of simplex methods. And there are many missing um, things here in abstract complexity. Yeah, regarding the derivative, I mean, I think Alex did consider when uh, the subdifferential in the abstract sense was was unique. Yeah. And so that 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 gives you a kind of derivative, and it's just related to I think some sort of strict strict monotonicity locally generates it being unique and so in that mm -hmm. case then you've got that directional derivative of mm -hmm. f in at x in the direction x over x being is, is the unique element but uh, there are many examples where we don't have the unique of the uh, um of mm -hmm. the subdifferential set for example if we take the function is uh, increasing like um like the quadric function for example or like um then we don't have the uniqueness of the uh, um mm -hmm. It not even about it of the uh, subdifferential. So I think it should have something more general than uniqueness. And it should be easy to calculate as well, like the exact formulation for the, um, 
support mm. for calculate the derivative. That's a good. It's a good point, and uh, I'm I'm glad that uh, for young people thinking about this, so that they can, um, you know, uh, do work. I can't I can't really give any other insight into that one. Uh, mm. um, uh, it. Uh, I, I agree. It 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 does. It does seem to be. I mean, certainly the usual derivative is not going to do the job. I think you've got to mm. you've got to do something else. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think it should start from uh, how the local information imply global information. In, in, in a way, um, the uh, the IPH functions are almost too general already, because 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 in fact what you can do is you can sort of claim that the the, I, the uh, IPH functions restrict restrict to the unit simplex. If you take all the IPH functions and restrict them to the unit simplex, you get all, the, all lower semi-continuous functions. Mm -hmm. You know, so in that sense, uh, they're, they're really a lifting of all lower semi-continuous functions into the positive ornithin, into these other class of functions. And so I don't, I don't know whether the, I, I mean, certainly that with the, um, uh, the these uh, star-shaped sets and the uh, uh, the ICAR functions, you know, that's a lifting in itself, you know, you're sort of lifting a, uh, a notion again into another dimension to get mm -hmm. another class. Whether, whether the ideas of lifting classes of functions into one dimension higher or lower allows one to get somewhere with these problems more, I don't know. But that, that's, quite, that's still quite a modern notion. I mean, it was interesting to see that Alex was doing those things mm -hmm. so many years ago when now they are, uh, in other areas, quite, quite a, you know important idea. Thank you, Andrew. More questions? Yes, um, I think that uh, this was very informative talk and uh, very interesting. Of course, I mean, I also worked in this area and uh, still I, 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 I'm doing some research, but the more uh, computational. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, this is um, global optimization is very close to combinatorial optimization. I mean, this is uh, clear if you uh, 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 at the beginning, uh, when we uh, started to implement the uh, cutting angle method, uh, we got very uh, promising results, but then uh, we realized that in fact, uh, so um, ability of cutting angle method alone to solve global optimization methods, uh, so, uh, problems is quite uh, restricted. Again, uh, we can talk about maybe maximum 10 variables uh, not many. Uh, that's why actually then uh, uh, we were thinking to uh, uh, combine this method with other local methods and uh, do some kind of uh, uh, subspace searching, not uh, say consider the whole problem in a uh, whole space. So um, I think that uh, I, and I agree, I also uh, mentioned this one. Uh, Still, uh, we have a huge potential here uh, to develop uh, more accurate, more efficient methods for uh, global optimization. And uh, similar to what happened with uh, uh, non sumus optimization when a bundle method was uh, introduced uh, and uh, it was uh, based on a cutting plane method. So uh, still, I think that we didn't reach that point in, uh, in, the, in the case of global optimization when we try to use uh, cutting angle. But it's a huge uh, uh, potential here and uh, unsolved problems. Yeah, so. I, I, do, I do think, uh, you know, uh, de decomposition kind of techniques, I mean, they're, they're big in combinatorial optimization too, because, you know, the, the, the problems are too big there as well often. and. Uh, so yeah. try, trying to sort of tackle the curse of dimensionality, which is what you're talking about, is a common theme in many areas. And so, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to see whether, you know, I mean, that, that's why ADMM became so so important and so popular so quickly, is yeah. its, uh, its ability to kind of interface with parallel computing and so on. So, I mean, these, these issues of trying to tackle, you know, the, the curse of dimensionality, are trying to use some sort of decomposition technique and, and parallel processing 
hasn't been tried in abstract convexity either. You know, like that, I, would, I, would, I would think that that's kind of a natural place to look. Yeah, exactly. I think that uh, we should not uh, consider the uh, general uh, Lipschitz continuous functions. No, no. As, as I said yeah, before, the some, uh, yeah. Big, you know? yeah. Exactly. Then I think that we can uh, design better methods and uh, more accurate computation. Any other questions? There is one comment from Scott in chat box, Andrew. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, let me just try and see. Um, I've got to try and bring up the chat box now. Uh, Can you see it? Uh, uh, no, I'm just trying to, I'm going to minimize my slides here to see whether I, okay. in fact, I'll stop sharing because that way I can find the chat box. Okay, Scott's question is, uh, the question is how to bring the theory to, uh, to splitting methods would be an interesting one. Thanks for the informative talk, Andrew. Sorry, my connection is so bad. I do not dare ask it over the microphone. Uh, how to bring the theory of splitting methods. Um, Yes, I mean, uh, um, th that is a good question. I mean, I, I mean, in, um, I, I think, I think again, uh, splitting methods have become quite important. I think in, uh, say, in a, a lot of areas, say, like uh, um, um, uh, uh, in stochastic optimization, things like that, where you have special structures in the problem, you know. And also in the signal processing and special structures in the problem that you can exploit. So again, I think what one needs to do is to try and look for that special class of problems where those kind of standard techniques we've seen appear elsewhere can be translated over into this area. So I think if we're going to look at the general Lipschitz optimization problem, we're going to be disappointed in trying to find find ways. But but, but people are not trying to solve that general problem. They're trying to solve problems with special structures that rise in various application areas, and that's where ADMM and splitting methods have become very, very popular and, and very important. Yeah. You know, I think that, I think that's the answer. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for very good and uh, nice presentation. So we can move to next one, and uh, our next speaker is uh, Rahina Brachik, and she will talk about abstract convexity and the zero duality gap. <laughs> 